Chapter Four, Part Three of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Three, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourteen, the men therefore, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, "This is of a truth the prophet that should come into the world." They marvel at the sign who know how to approve things God befitting and regulate themselves by human reason rather than are diseased with unreason befitting the beast as were the blasphemous jews who when they ought to have profited by the publicity of the things wrought lost even the power of right judgment for they deemed that jesus ought now to be stoned also because he so often appeared as a worker of miracles superior then and that in no small degree to the folly of those men are they who marvel soberly persuaded by this one great miracle that he it surely was whose coming into the world as a prophet was foretold but observe how great a difference hence appears i mean between the race of israel and those situate out of judea for the one although they were spectators of many things and those not unworthy of admiration are not only hard of heart and inhuman but also desire unjustly to slay him who was zealous to save them driving him with their wild folly from their city and country while they who dwelt away from jerusalem and hence signify the race of aliens from one miracle alone glorify him and nobly determine that their conceptions of him should be received with faith unhesitatingly from all these things was israel shown to be self-condemned and self-invited to her final just rejection and that it was due to the gentiles to obtain at length their share of mercy from above and love through christ fifteen when jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king he departed again into the mountain himself alone most praiseworthy judgment would one give and full rightly to those who had been easily brought by the great miracle to believe that it was indeed befitting that their very choicest should be christ and their chiefest offered to him as an honour for what else but this does their desire to choose him for their king signify to us but among other things one may admire this too for christ is made an example to us of contempt of glory in that he flees from those who desire to give him due honour and refuses a kingdom that highest earthly prize although to him it was in truth no object of envy in that he with the father reigneth over all things yet giveth he to them too who look for the hope to come to understand that little to them is worldly greatness and that it is not good to accept honours in this life that is in the world though they offer themselves that they may mount up to honour from god for unseemly is it in truth that they should wish to shine in these things who are pressing on to the divine grace and thirsting for everlasting glory we must then eschew the love of glory sister and neighbour of arrogance and not far distant from its borders and illustrious honour in this present life let us eschew as hurtful let us rather seek for a holy lowliness giving way to one another as the blessed paul too admonishes saying be each among you so minded according to what was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god but emptied himself taking servant's form made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself made obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore god also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name seest thou how his voluntary abasement hath a glorious consummation and his lowly mindedness shows itself a root of many good things to us for the only begotten being in the form of god the father hath humbled himself being made man for our sakes but even though he appeared in this life with flesh 
yet he remained not lowly for he hazed back to his ancient dignity and to his god-befitting glory even though he became man this same way may one suppose will it be as to us too for when we bring ourselves down from the empty heights of the present life and seek low things then shall we surely receive in return the glory from above and mount up unto being gods by grace receiving after likeness so to say to him who is truly and by nature son and being called children of god and that i may say something akin to the subject before us let us refuse if it offer itself excellency upon earth the mother of all honour if we mind heavenly things and live for things above rather than those on the earth but our discourse is not devoid of spiritual thought therefore we will repeat summing up as it were the whole force of what has been done and again going through from the beginning the account before us for so will it become clear to us what is about to be said especially as the blessed evangelist hath added as though hinting at something necessary and not to be rejected that he withdrew into the mountain himself alone therefore rejecting the cruelty of the jews christ began to depart from jerusalem which plainly is i have forsaken mine house i have left mine heritage when he had crossed the sea of tiberias and was very far removed from their folly he goes up into a mountain together with his disciples this we said signified the impassable so to say and impracticable nature of the way to him unto the jews and christ withdrawal from them in anger at his passion for a season that is the fit time and that christ will be manifest together with his disciples when he departs from judea and goes unto the gentiles transferring his grace to them from the mountain did he look on them that followed him and moreover take thought for their food and this again we said signified as it were typically the supervision from above which is due to the saints according to the eyes of the lord are upon the righteous and that christ is not without thought for them that fear him next much people were miraculously fed with the five loaves and the two little fishes of which we defined that they ought to be conceived to be the writings of the saints old and new set by the apostles before them that love christ moreover that the choir of the disciples will receive from god the rich fruit of their ministry to usward and after them the overseers of the holy churches of god for the type was in the beginning to all in them next the spectators marvel at the miracles and devise to take jesus by force for a king this he understanding departs alone into the mountain as it is written for when christ was marvelled at by the gentiles as wonder-worker and god when all enrolled him their king and lord then was he received up alone into heaven no one at all following him thither for he the first-fruits of the dead had gone up alone into the great and truer mountain according as is said by the psalmist who shall ascend into the hill of the lord or who shall stand in his holy place he that hath clean hands and a pure heart for such an one shall follow christ and shall go up into the spiritual mountain also at the time of the kingdom of heaven but he hath withdrawn into the mountain that is hath gone up into heaven not refusing to reign over them that believed on him but delaying the time of his more manifest kingdom until his return to us from above when he shall descend in the glory of the father no longer by miracles as before known to be truly and by nature lord but by god befitting glory confessed that he is undoubtedly king therefore for i will say it again briefly compressing the multitude of words when by his miracles he was believed on and acknowledged to be god having gone away from the jewish people then do all press forward to receive him for their king 
but he ascends into heaven alone laying up for its fitting time the more open manifestation of his kingdom sixteen seventeen and when even was come his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea unto capernaum the first sign having been miraculously accomplished his flight and withdrawal are economically found to be the route again and occasion of another and the wonder-worker proceeds as it is written from might to might for since he was being sought as king by them who were astonished at that great miracle and was himself refusing worldly honours according to the preceding account it was altogether necessary that he should depart from the place yea rather from their whole country in order then that he might seem to have sailed away and might relax somewhat the intensity of the seekers he orders the disciples to depart before him but himself stays advancing opportunely unto the next miracle for it was his most earnest endeavour by every occasion and act to confirm the mind of the apostles in their faith to himward for since they were to be teachers of the earth and to shine forth as lights in the world as paul saith he necessarily led them to all things that would profit them for this was to show kindness not on them alone but to those also who should be led by them unto the unerring apprehension of him but why will some one perchance say after that miracle is the power of jesus to walk on the sea immediately introduced such an one shall hear a very credible cause for when he desired to feed the multitudes philip and andrew supposed that he would be powerless thereto the one saying that no small sum of money would barely suffice them for just a little enjoyment the other telling that five loaves and two small fishes were found with one of the lads nay that what was found was nothing to so great a multitude and from all so to speak their words they thought that he could do nothing out of the due course of our affairs needs in order that he might free himself from so petty a conception and might bring the still feeble mind of the apostles to learn that he doth all things wondrously which he willeth unrestrained by the nature of things the necessary order of things not hampering him in the least does he place under his feet the humid nature of the waters albeit unpractised to lie under the bodies of men for all things were possible as to god evening then being now come and the time abating the vigilance of those who were seeking for him the choir of the holy disciples goes down to the sea and began to sail away immediately obeying in all things their god and teacher and that without delay eighteen and it was now dark and jesus was not come to them and the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew many things at once are being profitably contrived and the circumstances drive the disciples to a more zealous search after their saviour for the deep darkness of the night troubles them hovering like smoke upon the raving waves and takes from them all knowledge of whither at length to steer moreover the fierceness of winds troubles them not a little riding on the waves with a rushing noise and raising the billows to unwonted height yea and though these things had taken place jesus it says was not yet come to them for herein was their special danger and the absence of christ from the voyagers was working increase of their fear they therefore must needs be tempest-tossed who are not with jesus but are cut off or seem to be absent from him through their departure from his holy laws and severed because of sin from him who is able to save if then it be heavy to be in spiritual darkness if grievous to be swallowed up in the bitter sea of pleasures let us receive jesus for this will deliver us from dangers and from death in sin the figure of what has been said will be seen in what happened he will therefore surely come to his disciples Nineteen twenty 
so when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs they see jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship and they were afraid but he saith unto them it is i be not afraid when they are separated by great interval from the land and it was like that they in their trouble would no way be saved for they were now in the midst of the sea then christ thrice longed for appears to them for thus could he give most welcome salvation to those in danger when fear had already cut off all hope of life but he appears to them miraculously for so was it ordered to their greater prophet and they are astonished beholding jesus going through the midst of the sea and upon the very waters and make the miracle an addition to their fear but christ immediately relieves them from their misfortunes saying i am be not afraid for need need must all disquiet be away and they be openly superior to all danger to whom christ is now present we shall see then by this again that we ought to have a spirit courageous and manly in temptations and endurance intense from hope in christ confirmed unto good confidence in our being surely saved even though many be the fears of temptation that pour around us for observe that christ does not appear to those in the boat immediately on their setting sail nor at the commencement of their dangers but when they are many furlongs off from the land for not when the condition which harasses us first begins does the grace of him who saves visit us but when the fear is at its height and the danger now shows itself mighty and we are found so to say in the midst of the waves of afflictions then unlooked for does christ appear and puts away our fear and will free us from all danger by his ineffable power changing the dread things into joy as it were a calm twenty one they therefore would receive him into the ship and immediately the ship was at the land whither they were going the lord not only releases the voyagers from dangers wondrously shining on them but also frees them both from toil and sweat by his god-befitting power thrusting forward the ship on to the opposite shore for they were expecting that by rowing on still they should with difficulty be able to reach the end but he releases them from these their toils revealing himself to them in a very little time the worker of many miracles to their full assurance when then christ appears and beams upon us we shall without any labor succeed even against our hope and we who are in danger through not having him shall have no more need of toil to be able to accomplish what is profitable for us when he is present christ then is our deliverance from all danger and the accomplishment of achievements beyond hope to them that receive him but since we have discoursed upon every portion of the subject singly come and let us joining the meaning hereof with the connection of the preceding portions work out the spiritual interpretation we said then that jesus ascended into heaven as into a mountain that is to say being received up after his resurrection from the dead but when this has taken place then his disciples alone and by themselves a type of ecclesiastical teachers in succession throughout all time swim through the billows of this present life as a kind of sea meeting with varied and great temptations and enduring no contemptible dangers of teaching at the hands of those who oppose the faith and war against the gospel preaching but they shall be freed both from their fear and every danger and shall rest from their toils and misery when christ shall appear to them hereafter too in god befitting power and having the whole world under his feet for this i deem his walking on the sea signifies since the sea is often taken as a type of the world by divine scripture as it is said in the psalms this great and wide sea there are things creeping innumerable both small and great beasts 
when christ then cometh in the glory of his father as it is written then shall the ship of the holy apostles that is the church and they that sail therein that is to say they who through faith and love toward god are above the things of the world without delay and without all toil gain the land whither they were going for it was their aim to attain unto the kingdom of heaven as to a fair haven and the saviour confirms this understanding of all that has been said in that he says to his disciples at one time a little while and ye shall no more see me and again a little while and ye shall see me at another again tribulation shall ye have in the world but be of good cheer i have overcome the world but in the night the lord cometh down from the mountain and visiteth his disciples who are watching and they look on him coming not without fear for they tremble that something needful for our understanding may in this too be made known unto us for he shall descend from heaven as in the night the world yet sleeping and slumbering in much sin therefore to us too doth he say watch therefore for ye know not what hour your lord doth come the parable too of the virgins will no less teach us this for he says that five were wise five foolish but while the bridegroom tarried they all slumbered and slept and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him seest thou how at midnight the bridegroom is announced to us and what the cry is and the mode of the meeting the divine paul will make known saying at one time for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a summons with voice of archangel with the trump of god at another of the saints who are raised up we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord but the disciples being smitten with fear albeit they saw him coming and were found in toil and watching signifies that the judge will come terrible to all and that the righteous man will surely quake within himself proven as by fire albeit ever foreseeing him who was to come and not shrinking from toils and virtue nourished in vigilance alike and good watching but the lord doth not enter into the ship with his disciples as though he were going to sail with them but rather moveth the ship on to the land for christ will not appear co-working any more with those who honour him unto their achievement of virtue but to give to them that have already achieved their looked-for end twenty two twenty three the morrow when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one whereinto his disciples were entered and that jesus went not with his disciples into the boat yet that his disciples had gone away howbeit there came other boats from tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after that the lord had given thanks the miracle does not escape notice i mean jesus walking on the very sea although it took place by night and in the dark and was ordered in secret but the crowd of those who were wont to follow him perceives assured as is probable by much watching that he had neither sailed with his disciples nor had crossed in any other ship for there was there the apostleship alone which they took and went away before him not then is hidden of what is good even though it be performed in secret by any and here we see that that is true nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest neither hid that shall not be known and come abroad i say then that he who desires to track the footsteps of christ and as far as man can to be moulded after his pattern ought not to be eager to live in much boasting nor when he practices virtue to be led away in pursuit of praise nor if he enter upon an extraordinary and exceeding disciplined life should he desire to glory immoderately thereat 
but should desire to be seen alone by the eyes of the deity who revealeth hidden things and that which is performed in secret bringeth he into clearest apprehension twenty four when the people therefore saw that jesus was not there neither his disciples they also took shipping and came to capernaum seeking for jesus these men follow him marvelling perchance at his miracles yet not receiving any profit from them unto the duty of faith but as though they were making some return to the wonder-worker by merely bestowing on him a not undesired praise for this is a dreary disease of a mind and soul which is never accustomed to be led to the choice of what is profitable for her the reason why this was so with them was that they delighted solely in the pleasures of the flesh and jumped eagerly at the meanest temporal food rather than hasten after spiritual goods and endeavor to gain what would support them to life eternal this you will learn clearly by what follows too twenty five and when they had found him on the other side of the sea they said unto him rabbi when camest thou hither their speech takes the form of being that of those who love him and feign sweetness but is convicted of being exceeding senseless and childish for they ought not on meeting with so great a teacher to have talked to no purpose and taken no pains to learn anything for what was the need of being eager to ask him when he came there what good would they be likely to get from knowing we must then seek wisdom from the wise and let a prudent silence be preferred to undisciplined words for the disciple of christ bids that our speech be seasoned with salt and another of the wise exhorts us to this saying my son if thou hast a word of understanding answer if not lay thy hand upon thy mouth and how evil it is to be condemned for an undisciplined tongue we shall know from another for he says if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart this man's religion is vain twenty six jesus answered them and said verily i say unto you ye seek me not because ye saw the miracle but because ye ate of the loaves and were filled we will say something common yet worn by little use great teachers are often wont to be not slightly angry when they are questioned about vain and useless matters and we shall find them so not out of haughtiness but rather from annoyance at the folly of the questioners of us therefore and those like us i think that this is not unrightly said but the saviour inflicts a warm rebuke upon those people who made those inquiries for speaking uninstructedly and unwisely inquiring not because it was their duty to seek out the things whereby they might become honest and good but because they followed him for carnal reward and that a most mean one for what is less than daily food and that not sumptuous we must then practise piety towards christ and love of him not that we may obtain aught of carnal goods but that we may gain the salvation that is through him and let us not say good words to him as these say rabbi nor devise fair speaking as a foundation of gain and boundless in gathering of riches truly he that attempts such things will not be ignorant that he shall encounter christ who keenly convicteth him and revealeth his hidden wickedness it is meet again to admire also the economy herein for when he saw that they were enveloped with the aforementioned disease as a physician skilful and master of his art he devised a twofold medicine for them entwining the helpful reproof with most glorious miracle the miracle then we shall find in his knowing their thoughts and in the wonder-worker not telling them what they sought not out of piety to know you will behold the reproof and the advantage is twofold for in that he knows perfectly their devices and has accurate perception thereof he shows that they are without understanding and that they think to escape the divine eye 
while they heap up wickedness in their heart, and practice sweet words with their tongue. But this is the part of one who persuades them to leave off this their disease, and to cease from no slight sin. For outrageous is he and lawless, who hath this conception of God. In usefully convicting them of sinning, he restrains in some sort the future course of evil. For that which has no hindrance creeps on and extends itself. But when caught in the fact, it is well nigh ashamed, and like a rope contracts into itself. Therefore the Lord profited them by reproving also, and by those things whereby one thinks that he smites, by these very things he is seen to be their benefactor. We must then hold that even though some flatter, or with mild words wheedle the rulers of the churches, yet are not sound concerning the faith, it is not meet that they should be carried away by their fawnings, nor by way of payment for their applause lend in turn to them who need correcting, silence in regard to their faults. But we ought rather boldly to rebuke them, and to persuade them to change for the better, or at least hereby if so be to profit others, according to that spoken by Paul. Them that sin rebuke before all, that the rest also may fear this then for the subject separately but that they are in connection and of necessity follow those before considered i think i ought to show we said then that our saviour's coming down from the mountain typified his second and future coming to us from heaven and we added as in summary that he appeared to his disciples while they were watching and yet toiling and released them from their fear and brought the ship at once to land. And what is hence portrayed to us, as in a type, we have there declared. But now observe, that after Jesus had come down from the mountain, certain miss following him, and come to him at last. For they come on the day following, the evangelist having not without care added this also. Then on meeting with him, they endeavor to wheedle him with good words, but Christ chides them, bringing upon them hot and keen reproof, that we might consider this again, that after the coming of our Lord to us from heaven, most vain and profitless unto men is the search after good things, nor will the desire to follow him find any fitting season. Yea, even though certain approach him, thinking to appease him with smoothest words, they shall meet the judge no longer mild and gentle, but reproving and avenging. For thou wilt see the flattery of them that are reproved, and the reproof itself in the words of the Saviour, when he saith, Many will say to me in that day, to wit, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not in thy name cast out devils? But says he, Then will I profess unto them, Verily I say unto you, I never knew you. For ye sought me not purely, saith he, nor loved to excel in holiness, for thereby would I have known you. But since ye practiced piety in semblance only, and in mere imaginaries for the purpose of gain, justly do I confess that I have not known you. What then in that passage is Lord, Lord, here is rabbi to whomsoever therefore punishment is a bitter thing let him not fall into inertness nor be manifoldly infirm in transgression looking to the goodness of god but let him prepare his works for his going forth as it is written and make it fit for himself in the field that is to say while he is in the world for the Saviour interpreted that the field is the world. Let him prepare to show holiness and righteousness before the divine judgment seat. For he will behold no unseasonably clement judge, nor yet yielding to entreaties for mercy, in him whom he ought without delay to have obeyed when he was calling him to salvation. While the time of mercy was granting to him both to beg for forgiveness for his already past transgressions, 
and to seek for loving kindness from god who saves twenty seven labor not for the meat which perisheth but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life something of this sort doth paul teach us expanding the discourse universally and more generally saying he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting for he says that they sow to the flesh who giving as it were full rein to the pleasures of the flesh advance at full speed to whatever they will by no means distinguishing what is profitable for them from what is hurtful and injurious nor in any way accustomed to approve what seems good unto the lawgiver but heedlessly hurried off to that alone which is pleasant and agreeable and preferring nothing to things seen again he affirms that they sow to the spirit who expend the whole aim of their mind on those things wherein the holy ghost willeth us to excel employing a mind so intense toward the cultivation of good things that did not voice of nature not to be disregarded constrain them to minister needful food to the flesh they would not endure to descend even to this i think then that we ought to take no forethought whatever for the flesh for the lust thereof but rather to apply ourselves to what is most needful and to be zealous in practising those things which bring us to the everlasting and divine life for admiration for the delights of the body and the esteeming nothing better than the superfluities of the belly is truly brutish and akin to the extremest folly but to apply ourselves to good things and earnestly to strive to excel in virtues and to be subject to the laws of the spirit and with all readiness to seek after the things of god which are able to support us unto salvation i will grant that this truly beseemeth him who knoweth his own nature and is not ignorant that he hath been made a reasonable creature after the image of him that created him therefore as the saviour somewhere saith take we no thought what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed but considering that the soul is more than meat and the body than raiment let us take thought how the more precious part of us may do well for though the body do well and be fat with succession of delights it will not profit the miserable soul but on the contrary will work it much harm for it will depart into the everlasting fire since they who have wrought no good must needs undergo punishment for it but if the body have been bridled with due reason and brought under the law of the spirit both must surely be saved together it is then most absurd that for the flesh we should so take thought which is but for a time and even now shall perish as to think that it ought not to lack any one thing which it loves and to take care for the soul by way of appendix or as though it were nothing worth albeit i think we ought to apply ourselves so much the rather to cares for the soul as it is of more value than the body for so of a truth preferring what surpasses in the comparison to what is inferior and giving a just vote in this matter we shall become holy and wise jurors and not bestow upon any other the palm of right reasoning but rather shall put it upon our own heads let us then as the saviour saith labour not for the meat which perishes which when it hath passed into the belly and for a very little while deluded the mind with petteous pleasure goeth out into the draught and is conveyed forth again from the belly but the spiritual food which strengthened the heart keepeth the man unto life everlasting which also christ promised to give us saying which the son of man shall give unto you at once knitting the human with that which is divine and connecting the whole mystery of the economy with flesh in its order 
but he hints i suppose at the mystic and more spiritual food whereby we live in him sanctified in body and soul but we shall see him speaking more openly of this hereafter the discourse then must be kept for its fit time and place End of chapter 4chapter five of commentary on the gospel of john book three by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five that the only begotten son is the impress of the person of god the father and no other impress either is or is conceived of save he which the son of man shall give unto you for him the father sealed god he was not ignorant as god of the charges that would result from jewish folly nor of the reasons why they were often foolishly enraged he knew that they would reason in themselves looking to the flesh alone and not conceiving of god the word therein who is this that seizes upon god befitting words for who can give unto men food that keepeth them unto everlasting life? For wholly foreign to man's nature is such a thing, and it beseemeth him alone who is God over all. The Saviour therefore defends himself beforehand, and by seasonable arguments, shames their looked-for shameless talk. For he says that the Son of Man will give them the food which nourishes them unto everlasting life and immediately affirmed that he is sealed by the father sealed again is either put for anointed for he who is anointed is sealed or is showing that he has been by nature formed unto the father just as if he had said i am not unable to give you food which endureth and bringeth up unto everlasting life and delight for though i seem as one of you that is man with flesh yet was i anointed and sealed by god the father unto an exact likeness with him for ye shall see he saith that he is in me and i again in him naturally even though for your sakes i was born man of a woman according to the ineffable order of the economy for i can do all things in god befitting authority and do not in any way come short of the might inherent in my father and though god the father giveth you the spiritual food which preserveth unto everlasting life it is clear that the son too will give it even though made in flesh since he is his exact image the likeness in everything being conceived not after the lineaments of flesh nor yet aught conceived of in bodily form but in god befitting glory and equal power and royal authority but we must observe again that when he says that the son of man will give the things god befitting and that he hath been sealed unto the image of god the father he endureth not the division of him that separateth the temple of the virgin from the true sonship but defines himself and willeth to be conceived of again as one for one in truth over us is christ bearing as it were the royal purple of his own robe i mean his human body or his temple to wit of soul and body since one too of both is christ but most excellent sir will the christ opposer again say give the truth the power of overcoming deal not subtly with the saying dishonourably turning it about whithersoever thou wilt lo clearly hereby is the son proved to be not of the essence of the father but rather a copy of his essence suppose some such thing say they as we say a seal or signet impressed on wax for example or any other matter fit to receive it and engraving a likeness only of itself is taken away again by him who pressed it on having lost no part of itself so the father having imposed and imprinted himself wholly upon the son in some way by a most accurate likeness 
from himself hath he surely no part of his essence nor is conceived of as therefrom but a mere image and accurate likeness let him that is zealous for knowledge see that now too is our opponent darting on us like a serpent and rears aloft his head surcharged with venom but he who shattereth the heads of the dragon will shatter it too and will give us power to escape his manifold stubbornness let him then tell us who has just been dinning us with dreadful words does not the seal or signet which is made it may be of wood or of iron or of gold full surely seal with some impress those things whereon it comes and will it not be and be conceived of as a seal apart from the impress but i suppose that any one of our opponents too even against his will constrained by fitness unto the very truth would confess that it will by all means seal with an impress and without an impress according to fair reasoning not at all since then as the divine scripture testifies to us the son is the impress of the person of god the father in that he is in it and of it by nature whereupon is himself impressed or through whom else will the father seal his own impress for no one will say that the father is not altogether in god befitting form which is the son the form of him that begat him whom if any behold spiritually it is manifest that he will see the father wherefore he says that he too is in him naturally even though he be conceived to be of him by reason of his own existence as the brightness for instance is in the brightening and of the brightening and something different according to the mode of conception and again not different as viewed in relation to it because it is said to be of it and again in it and not i suppose in the way of division and complete essential partition are these things considered of for they are inherent in respect of identity of essence in those things whence they are and of which they are believed to be tending forth according to expression in idea to something else of their own yet not separate the word of the essence of the father not bare word nor without flesh is sealed then by the father yea rather through him are sealed those things which are brought to likeness with god as far as can be as we understand in that which certain say the light of thy countenance was marked upon us o lord for he says that the countenance of god the father is the son which is again the impress but the light thereof is the grace which through the spirit passes through unto the creation whereby we are remoulded unto god through faith receiving through him as with a seal the conformation unto his son who is the image of the father that our being made after the image and likeness of the creator might be well preserved in us but since the son is confessedly the countenance of god the father he will surely be the impress too with which god seals yea says our opponent we believe that god through the spirit seals the saints but the things that you are bringing forward have no place in the present question wherefore we will recapitulate and say the seal supposed to be of iron or may be gold impresses its own likeness on the matter whereon it comes losing nothing of its own but by the operation only of its being pressed on does it mark the things that receive it thus do we hold that the son has been sealed by the father not having aught of his essence but possessing merely an accurate likeness thereof and being other than he as the image to the archetype o boundless folly and perilous conceit how easily hast thou forgotten those things just now gone through for we said that the son was the impress of the father and that with him was sealed other than he and not himself lest he be thought to be his own impress but thou having not rightly spurned our argument hereon 
doth not blush to put about him a likeness of operation only in image only then will the son be god according to you and by nature not at all but merely in that he was fashioned and well formed after the likeness of him that begat haply no longer of him that begat for it is time that ye should on these accounts take away the begetting also yea rather there is every need even if ye will it not on the duty of believing that the son is begotten of the father we have already expended much argument or shall do so in its place but it were more fitting that we should proceed to the matter in hand putting forward to those who are accustomed unrestrainedly to shameless talk the question will they not surely say that that which is given may also be taken away and confess that that which is added can altogether be also lost for does it not at some time happen that everything is rejected which is not firmly rooted in any by nature it is evident even should any of them not assent thereto some time then or other according to the argument of possibility the son will be bereft of his likeness for he was sealed as ye say by the mere operation of his father upon him not having the stability that is of natural endowments but conceived of and existing wholly other than his father and completely severed from his essence doing then very excellently and foreseeing matters by most cunning reasoning did ye secure the father by saying that he gives naught of himself to the son save that he vouchsafes him likeness only lest aught of passion should be conceived of as about him for this is your foolish mystery for belike ye were ignorant that god the father who doeth all things without passion will also beget without passion and is superior to fire for the argument brings us down to this necessity which without passion or corporeal division begets the burning which is of it let those then hear who are zealous in fancies only and account unrestrained blasphemy to be not an unholy thing but rather a virtue that if they say that the son is classed with the father in the propriety of likeness alone he will abide in no secure possession of good things but will wholly risk his being by nature god and will in possibility at least admit of change for the worse for there were said to that governor of tyre too words which reason necessitates us to attribute to the person of the devil thou art the seal of the likeness but he to whom that speech is addressed is found to have fallen from the likeness thou seest then and clearly too by such instances that the mere being in the likeness of god is no security for an unmoved stability in things spiritual nor yet does it suffice to perfect endurance in the good things in which they are to have been duly sealed unto the nature of the maker for they too fall and are born headlong oft times changing into a worse mind than they had at the beginning it is then possible according to this argument that the son attaining to likeness with the father by sameness of work only and not firm fixed by the prop of nature but having his stability in the mere motions of his own will should undergo change or though he do not suffer it should find the not so suffering the result of admirable purpose and not rather the steadfastness of native stability as god what then most noble sirs is the son no longer god in truth and if according to you he is so found why do we worship him why is he co-glorified with god the father why is he born as god upon the highest powers are then with us the holy seraphim themselves too ignorant that they do greatly err from what is fit in glorifying him who is not by nature god they err it seems in calling him who is honoured with equal honour lord of sevaoth or shall we not say 
that the highest powers principalities thrones and dominions and lordships essay after their power to appear conform to god for if the so small animal of the earth in respect of that creation i mean man be honoured with such beauty what reason has one not for fully thinking that to them who are far better than we far better things are allotted how then do they both call him lord of savoyoth and stand around as a guard as ministering to the king of the universe why sitteth he with the father and that on his right hand the bond with the lord the creature with the creator for is it not fitter to bring that which by means of heed and wariness is free from passion and perfect to the level of things originate rather than of god by essence who hath naturally the inability to suffer but it is manifest though they confess it not who then will endure these babblers or how will they not with reason hear woe to them that are drunken without wine but perchance they will be ashamed of the absurdities of such arguments and will betake themselves to this and say that the son was sealed by the father unto a most accurate likeness and is unchangeable in nature even though he be not from the father how then tell me will that which is not of god by nature bear his attribute and that be found not without share essentially of the excellences of the divine essence which proceeded not therefrom after the true mode of generation for it is i suppose clear and confessed by all that the properties of the godhead are wholly unattainable by the created nature and that the qualities belonging to it by nature will not exist in aught else that is in equal and exact manner as for example immutability is in god naturally in us by no means so but a kind of stability likens us thereto through heed and vigilance not suffering us readily to go after those things which we ought not but if it were possible that according to them aught of divine attributes should be in any who is not of the divine nature essentially and that they should be so in him as they are in it what tell me is to prevent all things god befitting from at length coming down even upon those who are not by nature gods for if one of them unhindered finds place i mean immutability there will be room for the rest also and what follows utter confusion for will not the superior pass below and the inferior mount up into the highest place and what is there yet to hinder even the most high god from being brought down to our level and us again from being gods even as the father when there no longer is or is seen any difference intervening if the qualities which belong to god only pass to us and are in us naturally and since god the father contains in himself alone as it seems those properties whereby we should be as he we have remained men and the angels likewise with us what they are not mounting up to that which is above all for if god should reveal himself not jealous by putting his own attribute into the power of all many surely would be those who were by nature gods able to create earth and heaven and all the rest of the creation for the excellencies of him who is by nature the creator having once passed on how will not they be as he is or what prevents that which is radiant with equal goods from appearing in equal glory but the god opposer surely sees completely how great the multitude of strange devices which is hence heaped up upon us and exclaims against the mislearning that is in him the godhead then will remain in its own nature and the creature will partake of it through spiritual relationship 
but will never mount up unto the dignity that unchangeably belongs to it but our argument being thus arranged we shall find that immutability exists essentially in the sun he is then god by nature and of necessity of the father lest aught that is not of him by nature should reach to an equal dignity of godhead but since they hold out to us as an incontestable argument their saying that the son is other than the father as image to archetype and through this subtlety think to sever him from the essence of him that begat him they shall be caught in no slight folly and to have studied their assertion to no purpose of any force in truth to accomplish fairly what they have at heart for what further are they vainly contending for or whence do they from only the distinctness of his own being sever the son from the father for the fact that he exists personally does not i suppose prove that he is diverse from the essence of him who begat him for he is confessedly of the father as being of his essence he is again in the father by reason of his being in him by nature and you will hear him say at one time i proceeded forth from the father and am come again at another time i am in the father and the father in me for he will not withdraw into a personality wholly and completely separated seeing that the holy trinity is conceived of as being in one godhead but being in the father in mode or position undivided as to consubstantiality he will be conceived of as likewise of him according to the procession which ineffably manifesteth him in respect of beaming forth for he is light of light therefore in the father and of the father alike undivided and separate in him as impress but as image to archetype will he be conceived of in his own person but we will not simply discourse concerning this but will confirm it by example from the law on all sides fortifying the force of truth against those who think otherwise the law then appointed to the children of israel to give to every man a ransom for his pole half a didram but one stater contains a didram yea and herein again was shadowed out to us christ himself who offered himself for all as by all a ransom to god the father and is understood in the one drachma but not separately from the other because that in the one coin as we said before two drachmae are contained thus may both the son be conceived of in respect of the father and again the father in respect of the son both in one nature but each separate in part as existing in his own person yet not wholly severed nor one apart from the other and as in the one coin were two drachmae having equal bulk with one another and in no ways one less than the other so shalt thou conceive of the in naught differing essence of the son in respect of god the father and again of the father in respect of the son and thou shalt at length receive wholesome doctrine upon all points spoken of concerning him twenty eight twenty nine they said therefore unto him what shall we do that we might work the work of god jesus answered and said unto them not of good purpose is the inquiry nor yet as one might suppose does the question proceed from desire of knowledge on their part but is rather the result of exceeding arrogance for as if they would deign to learn not beyond what they knew already they well nigh say something of this sort sufficient good sir to us are the writings of moses we know as much as we need of the things at which he who is skilful in the works of god ought to aim what new thing then wilt thou supply in addition to those which were appointed at that time what strange thing wilt thou teach which was not shown us before by the divine words 
the inquiry then is rather of folly than really of a studious will you have something of this kind in the blessed matthew too for a certain young man overflowing with not the most easily gotten abundance of wealth was intimating that he would enter upon the due service of god when he came to jesus he eagerly inquired what he should do that he might be found an heir of everlasting life to whom the lord saith thou knowest surely the commandments do not kill do not commit adultery do not bear false witness and the like but he as lacking none of these things or even not accepting an exposition of teaching which fell far short of his existing practice says all these things have i kept from my youth up what lack i yet what then he did joining haughtiness to ignorance in his question what lack i yet the same do these too through their overmuch arrogance alike and self-conceit saying what shall we do that we might work the works of god a good thing then is a low conceit and it is the work of a noble soul to commit to her teachers the thorough knowledge of what is profitable and so to yield to their lessons which they think it right to instil seeing they are superior in knowledge for how shall they be accepted at all as teachers if they have not superiority of understanding above what the mind of their pupils hath since their advance will scarcely end at the measure of their master's knowledge according to the word of the saviour the disciple is not above his master and it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master this is the work of god that ye believe on him whom he sent most severely doth the lord even though secretly as yet and obscurely attack the folly of the questioners for one would suppose looking merely at the simple meaning of the words that jesus was commanding them nothing else save to believe on him but on examining the intent of the words we will see that they refer to something else for full well does he arrange his discourse suitably to the folly of the questioners for they as though they learnt sufficiently through the law how to work what was well pleasing to god blasphemously neglect the teaching of our saviour saying what shall we do that we might work the work of god but it was necessary that he should show them that they were still very far removed from the worship most pleasing unto god and that they knew no whit of the true good things who cleaving to the letter of the law have their mind full of mere types and forms therefore with some great emphasis does he say opposing the fruit of faith to the worship of the law this is the work of god that ye believe on him whom he sent that is it is not what ye suppose he says looking to the types alone but know ye even though ye will not learn it that the lawgiver took no pleasure in your sacrifices of oxen nor needest thou to sacrifice sheep as though god willed and required this for what is frankincense though it curl in the air in fragrant steam what will the he-goat profit saith he and the costly offerings of cinnamon god eateth not the flesh of bulls nor yet drinketh he the blood of goats he knoweth all the fowls of the heaven and the wild beasts of the field are with him but he hateth and despised your feast and will not smell in your solemn assemblies as himself saith nor spake he unto your fathers concerning whole burnt offerings or sacrifices therefore not this is the work of god but rather that that ye should believe on him whom he sent for of a truth better than the legal and typical worship is the salvation through faith and the grace that justifieth than the commandment that condemneth the work then of the pious soul is faith to christward and more excellent far the zeal for to become wise in the knowledge of him 
than the cleaving to the typical shadows you will marvel also at this besides for whereas christ was wont to take no notice of those who questioned him tempting him he answers this for the present economically even though he knew that they would be nothing profited to their own condemnation as he says elsewhere too if i had not come and spoken unto them they had not sin but now they have no cloak for their sin thirty thirty one they said therefore unto him what sign doest thou then that we may see and believe thee what dost thou work our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written bread from heaven gave he them to eat the disposition of the jews unveils itself by little and little although hidden and as yet buried in less overt reasonings for they were saying in their folly what shall we do that we might work the works of god as if as we said before they held the commandment through moses sufficient to conduct them to all wisdom whereby they might know how to perform what was well pleasing unto god but their aim being such was concealed but is now being unveiled and by little and little comes forth more plainly for nothing is secret as the saviour says that shall not be made manifest what then are they saying what sign showest thou the blessed moses was honoured he says and with great reason he was set forth as a mediator between god and man yea and he gave to a sufficient sign for all they that were with him ate the manna in the wilderness but do thou at length since thou comest to us in a position greater than his and dost not shrink from adding to the things decreed of old with what signs wilt thou give us a warrant or of what wondrous works dost thou showing us introduce thyself as the author of more novel doctrines unto us hereby too is our saviour's word shown to be true for they are convicted by their own words of thinking that they ought to seek him not to admire him for those things which he had in god-befitting manner wrought but because they did eat of the loaves and were filled for they demand of him a sign not any chance one but such as they thought moses wrought when not for one day but for forty whole years he fed the people that came out of egypt in the wilderness by the supply of manna for knowing nothing at all it seems of the mysteries in the divine scriptures they did not consider that it was fit to attribute the marvellous working hereunto to the divine power which wrought it but very foolishly crowned the head of moses for this they therefore ask of christ a sign equal to that giving no wonder at all to the sign which had been shown them for a day even though it were great but saying that the gift of food ought to be extended to them for a long time for that even so hardly would he shame them into confessing and agreeing that most glorious was the power of the saviour and his doctrine therefore to be received manifest then is it even though they do not say it in plain terms that they wholly disregard signs and under pretext of marvelling at them are zealous to serve the impure pleasures of the belly End of chapter five Chapter Six, Part One of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Three, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six of the Manna, that it was a type of Christ's presence and of the spiritual graces through Him. Thirty-two, Jesus therefore said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you not moses hath given you the bread from heaven now too does the saviour most severely convict them of being without understanding and exceedingly ignorant of what is in the mosaic writings for they ought to have known quite clearly that moses was ministering the things of god to the people and again those of the children of israel to god 
and was himself the worker in none of the miracles but a minister rather and underworker of those things which the giver to them of all good things willed to do for the benefit of those who had been called out of bondage what they then were impiously imagining this christ very resolutely cuts away for to attribute things which befit and are due to the divine nature alone to the honour of men and not rather to it how is not this replete with folly alike and impiety and in that he deprived the hierophant moses of the miracle and withdrew it out of his hand it is i suppose manifest that he rather attributes the glory of it to himself together with the father even though he abstained from speaking more openly by reason of the uninstructedness of his hearers for it was a thing truly not contrary to expectation that they should rage as though moses were insulted by such words and should be kindled unto intemperate anger never inquiring what the truth was nor recognizing the dignity of the speaker but heedlessly going about to only honour moses and not reasonably as it happened when he was compared with what excelled him let us learn then with more judgment and reason to practise respect towards our holy fathers and to render as it is written fear to whom fear honour to whom honour for we shall in no wise injure if we render what fittingly belongs to each since the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets but when any discourse about our saviour christ is entered into then we must needs say who in the clouds can be equalled unto the lord or who among the sons of the mighty shall be likened unto the lord thirty three but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven for the bread of god is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world it was needful not only to remove moses from god befitting authority according to their conception and to show that he was a minister of that miraculous working rather than the bestower of it but also to lessen the wonder though miraculously wrought and to show that it was nothing at all in comparison with the greater for imagine christ calling out something like this the great things sirs do ye reckon among the little and meanest and the beneficence of the lord of all ye have meted out with most petty limits for with no slight folly do ye suppose that the manna is the bread from heaven although it fed the race alone of the jews in the wilderness while there are other nations besides without number throughout the world and ye suppose that god will to show forth loving-kindness so contracted as to give food to one people only for these were types of universalities and in the partial was a setting forth of his general munificence as it were in pledge to those who first received it but when the time of the truth was at our doors my father giveth you the bread from heaven which was shadowed forth to them of old in the gift of the manna for let no one think saith he that that was in truth the bread from heaven but rather let him give his judgment in favour of that which is clearly able to feed the whole earth and to give in full life unto the world he accuses therefore the jew of cleaving to the typical observances and refusing to examine into the beauty of the truth for not was that properly speaking the manna but the only begotten word of god himself who proceedeth from the essence of the father since he is by nature life and quickeneth all things for since he sprang of the living father he also is by nature life and since the work of that which is by nature life is to quicken christ quickeneth all things for as our earthly bread which is gotten of the earth suffereth not the frail nature of flesh to waste away so he too through the operation of the spirit quickeneth our spirit and not only so 
but also holdeth together our very body unto incorruption but since our mediations have once got upon the subject of manna it will not be amiss i think for us to consider and say some little on it also bringing forward out of the mosaic books themselves severally the things written thereon for thus having made the statement of the matter most clear we shall rightly discern each of the things signified therein but we will show through them all that the very manna is christ himself understood as given under the type of manna to them of old by god the father the beginning of the oracles thereon speaks on this wise on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of egypt the whole congregation of the children of israel were murmuring against moses and aaron and the children of israel said unto them would to god we had died stricken by the lord in the land of egypt when we sat by the flesh-pots and were eating bread to the full for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger the matter then of the history is clear and very plain and i do not think it needs any words to test the obvious meaning but we will speak of it looking only to the spiritual meaning the children of israel then while still in the country of the egyptians by divine command were keeping typically their feast to christ and having taken their supper of the lamb did thus hardly escape the tyranny of pharaoh's rule and shake off the intolerable yoke of bondage then having miraculously crossed the red sea they got into the wilderness and there famishing craved flesh to eat and were dragged down to the accustomed desire for food and so they began murmuring against moses and fall into repenting of their free gift from god when they ought to have given no small thanks for it egypt then will be darkness and will signify the condition of the present life and the worldly state wherein we enrolled as in some state serve a bitter serfdom therein working nothing at all to godward but fulfilling only the works most delightsome to the devil and hasting down unto the pleasure of impure flesh like clay or stinking mud enduring a miserable toil unpaid profitless and pursuing a wretched so to say love of pleasure but when the law of god speaks to our soul and we behold at length the bitter bondage of these things then oh then do we thirsting after riddance from all evil come to christ himself as to the beginning and door of freedom and provisioned with the security and grace that come through his precious blood we leave the carnal condition of this life as it were a troublous and stormy sea and out of all the tumult of the world we at length reach a more spiritual and purer state as it were sojourning in the wilderness but since he is not unexercised unto virtue who is through the law instructed thereunto when we find that we are at length in this case then we falling into temptations which try us are sometimes devoured by the memory of carnal lust and then when the lust inflames us mightily we cry oftentimes out of recklessness albeit the divine law hath called us to liberty being as it were in hunger for our old accustomed pleasures and making slight account of our toils after temperance we look upon the bondage of the world as no longer evil and in truth the will of the flesh is sufficient to draw the mind to all faint-heartedness after goodness and the lord said unto moses behold i rain you bread from heaven in these words you may very clearly see that which is sung in the psalms he gave them bread of heaven man did eat angels bread but it is i suppose evident to all that of the reasonable powers in heaven none other is the bread and food save the only begotten of god the father he then is the true manna the bread from heaven given to the whole rational creation by god the father 
but entering into the order of our subject we say this observe how the divine grace from above draws unto itself the nature of man even though at times sick after its wanted things and saves it in manifold wise for the lust of the flesh like a stone falling on the mind thrust it down and despotically forces it unto its own will but christ brings us round again as with a bridle unto longing for better things and recovers them that are diseased unto god-loving habit of mind for lo lo to them that are sinking down into carnal pleasures he promises to give food from heaven the consolation that is through the spirit the spiritual manna through this are we strengthened unto all endurance and manliness and obtain that we fall not through infirmity into those things we ought not the spiritual manna therefore that is christ was strengthening us before too unto piety but since we have once by reason of need digressed i think it well not to leave the subject uninvestigated since it is very conducive to our profit some one then may reasonably ask why is god who is so loving to man and so loveth virtue when it behoved him to forecome their request tardy in respect of his promise and he nowise punishes those so perverse men albeit he punished them afterwards when they were sick with the same lusting and pictured to themselves bread to the full and flesh-pots and admitted longing for the rankest onions for we shall find in numbers that both certain were punished and the place wherein they were then encamping was called the graves of lust for there they buried the people that lusted with respect then to the first question we say that it assuredly behoved him to wait for the desire and so at length to reveal himself in due season the giver for most welcome is the gift to those in good case where certain pleasures appear before it and precede it inciting to thirst after what is not yet come but the soul of man will be devoid of a more grateful sensation if it do not first stretch after and labor for the pleasures of being well off but perhaps you will say that there had been no way any entreaty from them but murmuring rather repentance and outcry for this would indeed be speaking more truly to this we say that entreaty through prayer will befit those who are of a perfect habit and perchance the murmuring of the more feeble from depression or whatever cause will partake of this and the saviour of all being loving to man is not altogether angry at it for as in those who are yet babes crying will sometimes avail to the asking of their needs and the mother is often called by it to find out what will please the child so to those who were yet babes and had not yet advanced to understanding the cry of weariness so to say has the force of petition before god and he punished not in the beginning even though he see them worsted by earthly lust but after a time for this reason it seems to me they who were but newly come forth of egypt not having yet received the manna nor having the bread from heaven which strengtheneth man's heart fall as might be expected into carnal lust and therefore are pardoned but they who had already delighted in the lord as it is written on preferring carnal delights to the spiritual good things have to give most righteous satisfaction and over and above their suffering have assigned them a notable memorial of their fate for the graves of lust is the name of the place of their punishment and the people shall go out and gather the day's portion each day we will consider the sensible manna a type of the spiritual manna and the spiritual manna signifies christ himself but the sensible manna adumbrates the grosser teaching of the law with reason is the gathering daily and the lawgiver forbids keeping it till the morrow darkly hinting to them of old 
that when the time of salvation at length shines forth wherein the only begotten appeared in the world with flesh the legal types should be wholly abolished and the gathering food thence in vain while the truth itself lieth before us for our pleasure and enjoyment and it shall come to pass on the sixth day and they shall prepare that which they bring in and it shall be double what they gather observe again that thou mayest understand that he does not suffer them to gather on the seventh day the sensible manna but commands that which is already provided and gathered to be prepared for their food beforehand for the seventh day signifies the time of the advent of our saviour wherein we rest in holiness ceasing from works of sin and receiving for food both the fulfilment of our faith and the knowledge already arranged in us through the law no longer gathering it as of necessity since more excellent food is now before us and we have the bread from heaven the man is collected in double measure before the holy sabbath and you will understand thence that the law being concluded in respect of its temporal close and the holy sabbath that is christ coming already beginning the getting of the heavenly goods will be after some sort in double measure and the grace twofold bringing in addition to the advantages from the law the gospel instruction also which the lord himself too may be conceived to teach when he says as in the form of a parable therefore every scribe instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a wealthy man which putteth forth out of his treasure things new and old the old the things of the law the new those through christ and moses and aaron said unto all the congregation of the children of israel at even ye shall know that the lord brought you forth from the land of egypt in the morning ye shall see the glory of the lord in that the lord giveth you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full moses promises to them of israel that quails shall be given them by god in the evening and declares that hereby they shall know surely that the lord brought them up out of egypt and in the morning ye shall see plainly he says the glory of the lord when he shall give you bread to the full and consider i pray you the difference between each of these for the quail signifies the law for the bird ever flies low and about the earth thus wilt thou see those too who are instructed through the law unto a more earthly piety through types i mean such as relate to sacrifice and purifications and jewish washing for these are heaved a little above the earth and seem to rise above it but are nevertheless in it and about it for not in the law is that which is perfectly good and lofty unto understanding moreover it is given in the evening the account again by evening signifying the obscurity of the letter or the darksome condition of the world when it had not yet the very light that is to say christ who when he was incarnate said i am come a light into the world but he says the children of israel shall know that the lord brought them out of egypt for knowledge only of the salvation generally through christ is seen in the mosaic book while grace was not yet present in very person this very thing he hinted at when he added in the morning ye shall see the glory of the lord in that he giveth you bread to the full for when the mist of the law as it were night hath been dispersed and the spiritual sun hath risen upon us all we behold as in a glass the glory of the lord now present receiving the bread from heaven to the full i mean christ himself and it was evening and the quails came up and covered the camp and in the morning as the dew ceased round about the host and behold upon the face of the wilderness a small thing 
as coriander seed white look at the arrangement of the things to be considered he says of the quails that they covered the camp of the manna again that in the morning when the dew was gone up it lay on the face of the wilderness round about the camp for the instruction through the law i mean that in types and figures which we have compared the appearance of quails covers the synagogue of the jews for as paul saith the veil lieth upon their heart and hardness in part but when it was morning that is when christ had now risen and flashed forth upon all the world and when the dew was gone up that is the gross and mist-like introduction of legal ordinances for christ is the end of the law and the prophets then of a surety the true and heavenly manna will come down to us i mean the gospel teaching not upon the congregation of the israelites but round about the camp that is to say to all the nations and upon the face of the wilderness that is the church of the gentiles whereof it is said that more are the children of the desolate than of the married wife for over the whole world is dispersed the grace of the spiritual manna which is also compared to the coriander seed and is called small for the power of the divine word being of a truth subtle and cooling the heat of the passions lulled the fire of carnal motions within us and entereth into the deep of the heart for they say that the effect of this herb i mean the coriander is most cooling and when the children of israel saw it they said one to another what is this for they wist not what it was being unused to what had been miraculously wrought and not being able to say from experience what it was they say one to another what is this but this very thing which is said interrogatively they make the name of the thing and call it in the syrian tongue manna that is to say what is this and you will hence see how christ would be unknown among the jews for that which prevailed in the type trial showed that it had also force in the truth and moses said to them let no man leave of it till the morning and they hearkened not unto moses but some of them left of it until the morning and it bred worms and stank and moses was wroth with them the morning in this place signifies the bright and most glorious time of the coming of our saviour when the shadow of the law and the mist of the devil among the nations being in some sort undone the only begotten rose upon us like light and spiritual dawn appeared the blessed moses then commanded not to leave of the typical manna until the morning for when the aforementioned time hath risen upon us superfluous and utterly out of place are the shadows of the law by reason of the now present truth for that a thing truly useless is the righteousness of the law when christ hath now gleamed forth paul showed saying of him for whom i suffered the loss of all things to wit glorying in the law and do count them dung that i may win christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of jesus christ seest thou then how as a wise man he took care not to leave of it till the morning they who kept of it unto the morning are a type of the jewish multitude which should believe not whose eager desire to keep the law in the letter should be a producing of corruption and worms for hearest thou how the lawgiver is exasperated greatly against them and moses said unto aaron take one golden pot and put therein manna an omer full and thou shalt lay it up before god to be kept well in truth may we marvel hereat and say o the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of god for incomprehensible in truth is the wisdom hidden in the god-inspired scriptures and deep their depth as it is written 
who can find it out thou seest then how our last comment fitteth these things for since christ himself was shown to be our very manna declared in type by way of image to them of old needs does he teach in this place of whom and of what virtue and glory will he be full who treasureth up in himself the spiritual manna and bringeth jesus into the inmost recesses of his heart through right faith in him and perfect love for thou hearest how the omer full of manna was put in a golden pot and by the hand of aaron laid up before the lord to be kept for the holy and truly pious soul which travaileth of the word of god perfectly in herself and receiveth entire the heavenly treasure will be a precious vessel like as of gold and will be offered by the high priest of all to god the father and will be brought into the presence of him who holdeth all things together and preserveth them to be kept not suffering to perish that which is of its own nature perishable the righteous man then is described as having in a golden vessel the spiritual manna that is christ attaining unto incorruption as in the sight of god and remaining to be kept that is unto long enduring and endless life christ with reason therefore convicts the jews of no slight madness in supposing that the manna was given by the all-wise moses to them of old and in staying at this point their discourse thereon and considering not one at all of the things presignified thereby by his saying verily i say unto you not moses hath given you the manna for they ought rather to have considered this and perceived that moses had brought in the service of mediation merely but that the gift was no invention of human hand but the work of divine grace outlining the spiritual in the grocer and signifying to us the bread from heaven which giveth life to the whole world and doth not feed the one race of israel as it were by preference end of chapter six part one